Oh, right. <laughs> so next time this one here. Oh, oh, awesome. I should have just read the sheet. <laughs> Glass. May I have a glass? No? Oh, glass. Can you get me glass? Thank you, Henry. Ah, I can see a red light. Is that what that says, Council of Little? You got better eyes than me. So we're just getting ourselves organised to start our next workshop, which is the Williston Local Area Traffic Management Study. And I think I'd just like to say hello to anyone who's watching on YouTube. Welcome. Uh, we're only a couple of minutes away uh, while we get our presentation uh, up. So hopefully you can see that as well. So I'll come back shortly. That's being shared so people from home can see that as well. Fantastic. Thank you, David. So uh, my name's Karen Redman. I'm the Mayor of the Town of Gaul. I'd like to welcome everyone here this evening, uh, members of, any, of, of our community that might be watching on YouTube, in particular council members who are here this evening. We have Cody Davies, we have Paul Kosh, we have uh, Paul Little, David Hughes, Deputy Mayor Brian Samble and Di Fraser. Welcome. And we also have um, members of our council team. Uh, we have Zach, we have Ben, and who is in charge of Sam Delina? No, no, Sam's, in, Sam's the leader. Um, but they're a wonderful team that have, put, uh, that have been coordinating this project. So thank you for all the work that you've been doing on this project. Uh, we have uh, Henry in it, uh, our CEO. Welcome, Henry. And we also, a very special welcome to our consultants presenting tonight, Jane Lovell from Murray F. Young. Now, I can't remember which one's Jane. Hello, Jane. And Zoe Hamber from Urban and Regional Planning Solutions, or URPS, as you're colloquially known to this session. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet on Ghana land this evening. Uh, we also acknowledge the Ghana people uh, as the custodians of the Greater Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Ghana people today. So this workshop has been convened for the purpose of what I said before, the Williston Traffic Study, uh, to provide a project update, brief council members on the community engagement process, discuss the updated LATM treatments, LATM is, of course, local area traffic management uh, and seek feedback on the draft plan and discuss the next steps. So as we know, this is an informal gathering and so it is not for the purpose of debating issues, building consensus positions or otherwise discharging council's deliberative and decision-making functions. There's no agenda and no, min and no minutes. Please turn your phones off or to silent uh, not if you work um, at home, you can do what you like. <laughs> you can text and phone and do what you like, isn't it great? Um, so uh, I don't think we'll be going into confidence, so uh, I look forward to the discussion. So without further ado, I'm handing over to you, Sam, Sam Delina, who's going to walk us through, and I'm sure Zach and Ben will be involved as well. Uh, thank you, Sam. Thank you, Madam Mayor and elected members for coming tonight. Um, in terms of the Williston LATM, uh, the last interface we had with the council was through the Infrastructure and Environmental Services Committee in October, um, where we put the draft plan after stage one, the first round of community consultation uh, back to the council for support to go out to the second round of consultation. Um, 
And that's since occurred. We undertook a consultation over the November, um, December period in uh, towards the end of last year. We had a little statewide lockdown in between, um, but that hasn't um, dampened the response with respect to the consultation. And uh, just speaking with Jane before, it's probably one of the more most um, respondents. Um, there was 107 in the second round on top of the 242, I think, from memory that we had in round one. So it's a phenomenal turnout. Um, I think from memory, the first round was about 12% of Williston responded. So this was probably closer to maybe, you know, six, five or 6% of Williston have responded. And and I won't steal all the thunder from the, from the girls' presentation, but um, the, effectively it's been a really successful process to date um, and it's been a you know, great engagement with the community. So we're getting towards the tail end of this journey. We're presenting a updated draft plan tonight, um, which has a number of recommendations, um, seeking a final round of engagement with uh, elected members ahead of, you know, considering that um, the last bit of feedback and finalising the report to present back to ideally the April IES. Um, so that's that's our intention. And um, then we can get, a, get ahead with um, actually implementing the uh, actions that have proposed. And we can talk about that in next steps as well. So on that, by, on that note, I might hand over to Zoe um, to talk through um, what we've been doing. Thank you, Sam, and thank you, Mayor and Councillors, for having Jane and myself along this evening to present to you. Um, so, well, do I point up here? Or do I point there? I think it's on. Is it on? Now it's on. Data projector. Data projector. <laughs> I don't know. Do you want to manage it, Sam? It would be that arrow, forward arrow. Not yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, turn it, yeah, forward yeah. arrow. Yeah. It's the left or What's right one. It's the left or right one. Yeah, it's not doing anything. There Thank you go. You. Thanks, Sam. Get a pay raise for this extra work you're doing. <laughs> no, don't, 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 don't. <laughs> Sorry, CEO. <laughs> Yes, so I'm Zoe Campbell. I'm from URPS and we've been working with MFY and supporting council um, through the community engagement. So the purpose of the workshop, as the Mayor run through, is um, ran through previously, is to provide you with the project update to explain the process we went through for this second round of community engagement, to provide you with information about what we heard from the community through that process. And then Jane's going to present um, some proposed updated changes to the draft LATM in response to the feedback we received from the community. Um, and we'd like to get your feedback on those changes this evening as well. Thank you, Sam. So just overall with the project update, sorry for all the words on this slide, essentially what we're aiming to do with it is just to show you the main, the key steps that have gone through with the project. So. Stage one community engagement happened in March last year. And that's where we went out and we aimed to find out what were the community's key issues um, that they, and the opportunities they saw for improving um, traffic in Williston. Then in May, uh, there was a workshop with you to present the results of that engagement and to get some feedback from you. Um, then everyone went away and created the draft LATM in response to your feedback and the communities. And um, that was endorsed by the committee, as Sam mentioned, on the 13th of October to go out for the purposes of community consultation. Then stage two community engagement, which is what we're all here to talk about tonight, that happened between November and December last year. So that was a three week period. And as um, Sam mentioned, right in the middle of that was when we went into that second six day lockdown, which ended up being, was it the six day one? It was one of the lockdowns anyway. So I think there were a few distracted people in the community probably because of that as well. Mm -hmm. um, we drafted a report with the results of the engagement. I believe that was distributed last week. Um, so some of you might've had a chance to read that report from URPS. 
So now we're here today and the purpose of this is really to um, show you what came out of that consultation and to get your feedback on some of the proposed changes that um, the administration and MFY are putting forward to you. Thanks, Sam. So this is just an excerpt from the committee resolution that happened um, on the 13th of October. Um, and that was carried unanimously. Sam, did you want me to speak to this? Or did you want to comment on that? Uh, not specifically other than to say, obviously, that's just supporting the methodology that we're undertaking right. and, and yeah. the fact that we were able to go out the consultation on this next stage. So nothing more than that. Okay, great. Thank you. So what was our approach to the engagement? So as I mentioned, it went for three weeks from about mid-November to early December. And really, we were asking two key questions. So first of all, how strongly do you agree with the draft prioritised recommendations of the plan? So in a minute, Jane's going to run you through what that prioritised map was. Obviously, an LATM is a, quite a big document and the aim of that map was to really show it visually um, what were the key recommendations coming out of that. So if the council stepped back from the whole plan and said, what are the main things we want to achieve? What are our key priorities? These are them. So we wanted the feedback from community about how strongly do you agree with that, with those um, prioritisations in the map? And then the second question was, overall, do you agree with the draft LATM plan as a whole? So there were two ways in which we sought people's feedback. One was um, through a feedback form that was distributed to all um, owners and residents of properties in Williston. And that survey or feedback form was then also put online from your, on your, your voice webpage as well. So people could access it online if they wanted to do it that way. We did have the drop-in open house on the 25th of November at the Williston Football Club as well. Thank you, Sam. So we, we really wanted to make sure um, we got really good participation with this, with this, with the, with the consultation. So, the letter went alongside the feedback form in hard copy form, and that went out to all the properties in Williston, as I mentioned. We emailed some of the key stakeholders, um, and you can see some of their names up there to ensure that your stakeholder partners were aware of the opportunity to provide feedback. Flyers um, were put out at council buildings, and an ad running ran in the Bunyip newspaper, and there was um, posts on council's Facebook page. And all those all those ways of getting the message out said you can provide your feedback through um, the feedback form or come along to the drop-in session. Thanks, Sam. So I might just hand over to Jane now briefly to explain this map. Thank you, Zoe, and, and thank you everyone for um, having us here tonight. Um, so this was um, the first um, summary map that we prepared in response to the initial round of community consultation. Um, plus it also was um, um, developed based on um, a technical analysis of the data that we had available from um, council in terms of the existing operation of um, the road network in Williston. And we went through and looked at what were the key issues that were raised both by the community and that were evident from um, a technical analysis of, um, of the area. Uh, and it, in essence, found that the operation of the roads were generally in accordance with the hierarchy that you would expect these roads to have, that there was no real pressing need for specific interventions as a result of how people were using the local roads in Williston. Um, there were some minor, relatively minor for a residential area, um, speed issues that warranted additional review, uh, but um, nothing that was over um, sort of uh, five to 10 kilometres over the speed limit, which is sort of, that's the red flag level. Uh, so that was really um, uh, helpful then in prioritising um, the uh, safety interventions that were needed in terms of driver behaviour on the road network. Um, it was also evident both from the community feedback and also just from driving around Williston that there were a number of opportunities for improving um, the um, pedestrian and cycling connection that had been flagged in the walking and cycling plan that, that council had um, um, endorsed a couple of years ago. And 
Uh, what we did with that information is to effectively use it to, to help council prioritise where footpaths were most needed. Um, the um, footpath, um, from a technical perspective, footpaths are not necessarily warranted on all roads from a safety perspective. There's a certain volume and speed environment where um, there's a general acceptance that people can walk on the road, even though it might be nice for them to have a footpath to have. Then once you step up to a particular volume, then it's, um, from a safety perspective, desirable to have a footpath on at least one side of the road. And then when you step up, step up, step up to another volume, speed categorisation, obviously having footpaths on both sides of the road is the best alternative. So we um, looked at where the footpaths were lacking and identified areas which should be um, targeted for footpath improvements as a priority. We also looked at the connectivity of Williston with, um, within the suburb because um, Williston has obviously the three arterial roads that effectively um, triangulate the um, suburb into three distinct areas, which are um, a, a real kind of disconnect from, for each area from the other. Uh, and we looked at where we would want to prioritise uh, pedestrian crossing opportunities along the arterial road network to provide people with um, safer alternatives for when they're wanting to get from one part of Williston to the other. And the final thing that we did was to look at some areas where um, the intersections were um, either had specific safety criteria that were of concern or that we um, knew were um, of a concern in terms of their functionality and highlighted those um, to have further review. Um, there wasn't a couple of those, there are some relatively easy technical answers which may not be all that easy um, to implement. For example, there's a site distance constraint at the Waylands, Red Bank, Dawkins, Haynes um, roundabout, which is as a result of somebody's fence line. And obviously to resolve that, it actually needs to have conversations with that property owner about um, their, their land. So um, there are a number of those um, sort of specific details that were teased out and um, also put together um, effectively a list of items that could be sent back to the department for issues which were outside of the council's control but which were really um, affecting the Williston community because of the operation of its arterial road network as well. Thank you Jane. So from an community engagement perspective the point of that map was really to say that the plan's a big document and it doesn't intend to replace all the content and the other directions that are in the plan, but it's really saying, you know, I guess in essence, council's got only so much money each year. Um, what what are the priorities? What do we need to focus on? What are the biggest issues that are going to have the most um, make the most difference to for people in Williston? So, and and that was the map that we asked for feedback on through the engagement as well as the plan overall. So in terms of the engagement, um, we had 107 feedback forms received. So that's about half the rate of stage one, but sometimes I think it's easier for people to come out when they've got a particular issue and to, and to voice that, which was what stage one was all about. Um, once you're asking people to read and digest plans, sometimes that cuts down the number of people that might have a say, but I think that's still really a, quite a positive number especially given everything that was happening with COVID at the time. So we had 17 people attend the open house and that, those numbers were definitely reduced, I think, by the COVID situation. 94% um, of the feedback forms, so 102 people, were Williston locals. And um, people aged over 65 were the most um, represented age group of households. So we asked people that completed the feedback form, what age groups um, of, uh, live in your household. So most people had 65 year old plus were the most represented age group, if that makes sense. But there were a quarter of households that did have children in them as well. So obviously that's an important consideration in Williston as well. Thanks, Sam. So this graph, take my glasses off for this one. 
these essentially are the, the results in a quantitative sense in a nutshell. So the top graph is asking, shows the results from when we ask people, how strongly do you agree with that map? How strongly do you agree that these are the prioritised recommendations that council should proceed with? So there was actually about 90% of people um, that either agreed or somewhat agreed. So it shows um, largely that the map and the priorities are well supported by the community. And there was only say 4% of people that disagreed with, with the prioritised recommendations. So the 63.6 .6 people that agree there is quite strong. And then you've got another say 25% that somewhat agree. So those somewhat agree people are probably saying, um, I agree with lots in it, but maybe there's also something I was hoping to see in the plan. Um, then when we ask people overall, how strongly do you agree with the, with the plan as in its entirety? Again, it was a really similar pattern in results. So you can see that most people that have provided feedback have said that they agree with the plan. And I think that's probably testament to the fact that you've done that earlier stage of engagement and those, their feedback had been considered in the draft that was put forward. Again, there were about 30% of people that somewhat agreed. So they might have um, felt that something they'd been hoping to see would be missed, but it's hard when you are producing a prioritised plan to have everyone's idea as a priority as well. So we received um, 70 comments as well. So people could vote on how strongly they agree, then provide some additional feedback in the form of comments. So we received 70 comments um, on the prioritised map and 52 comments on the draft plan as a whole. Thanks, Sam. So when you look at all the comments and if you ever feel like um, sitting down with a cup of tea, you can read Appendix C of the whole report, which has every single comment that was made, but I've tried to take some of the hard work out for you and have summarised it into the key themes that came out. So. One of the top issues that you probably aren't surprised by is about addressing speed on many of the roads in the area um, through either traffic calming or enforcement and signage. So there was a bit of a sense in some of the feedback that some people thought that there needed to be more done in terms of enforcement. Other suggestions were around traffic calming, so speed humps, um, that kind of thing, or just addressing speed in general. Um, addressing the lack of footpaths. So there were some people that wanted to see some footpaths on other roads other than which, I'm sorry, yeah, on other roads other than which were in the prioritised map. Parking and pedestrian safety um, particularly came up as an issue around the school, which you're probably aware of around pick up and drop off times. There could be a bit of conflict there at that time um, in people maybe not parking correctly, um, but also some concerns for, um, the safety of the children in that space at the same time. Lots of intersections came up um, as um, other areas that people would like to see looked at. Um, and looking at those, the main roads that they came up on um, was Red Bank's Main, North and Princess, but there was a, a whole lot of different combinations of intersections that are summarised in the report. And I can provide more information if you have any questions um, as well. Improving pedestrian and cycling links in the area was, was a theme. So that might be some desire for refuges or um, improving some links for people moving through Williston, say down to the river, um, or to be able to get to places like playgrounds safely. And many people just um, commented um, that they really welcome the improvements to the area. There was a bit of a sense that, you know, it's time and they're really grateful that something was going to get done. So that kind of summarises the key themes of the comments that came out of the, um, the engagement. My hand over to Jane to walk through, taking all that into account, what are some of the proposed adjustments to that prioritised solutions map that we're looking at? Uh, thanks, Zoe. Um, so uh, what we've done is added a couple of extra footpath um, connections in which we um, hadn't had in the plan originally, but which because they were included in the walking and cycling plan specifically, but we've just um, um, added those into this just for consistency with the walking and cycling plan recommendations. Um, 
There was also a number of people who raised concerns about footpaths that they would like on their road. Um, and most of those were on roads which didn't meet the volume requirements for having a footpath. But um, what we thought would be helpful to capture is that there's obviously a strong desire for um, footpaths in general. So we've um, so included a second tranche of footpath priority, if you like, um, for ones that wouldn't be necessarily technically warranted, but certainly would be an amenity improvement to the people that live along those roads. Um, we nominated locations where additional refuges on the arterial roads could be considered. So effectively the same thing we had done, sort of here's your first priority of what's definitely needed based on the current connection requirements. But there are also a number of locations where you could then roll out subsequent stages. Um, a lot of the locations along, particularly Main North Road, um, would get picked up by the proposed um, upgrades to Main North Road um, if they were implemented. So the um, opportunity to provide a median island along the road would obviously then open up a number of spots where you could formalise and informally provide pedestrian connectivity as well. But um, we've sort of then the, the, um, the second round of those hopefully will tie into an implementation of an upgrade for Main North Road, but we thought, well, we put those in just so that people can see that we have heard that there is a, um, a strong desire to improve the connectivity across the arterial roads in particular. Uh, Holmes Street, we had subsequent to the first plan um, received some additional data on a couple of the roads in the area because um, we had put a halt on that because of the COVID changes to people's travel behaviour. And Holmes Street had um, a relatively low volume of traffic because of the one-way nature of um, the connection to the arterial road network, but actually a relatively high speed. Um, so that's been now acknowledged in, um, in the plan as well. Uh, Brown Street, um, a concern that um, uh, had been raised in the initial um, in the initial discussions, but um, one of the gentlemen that came to the open house um, who lived on Brown Street um, was quite concerned about the safety of coming out of his um, his driveway. And Brown Street actually has a very narrow verge on one side, um, which we hadn't included an option to treat per se because we can't really fix that without. Um, changing the nature of the road, but actually I said to him that it would be an opportunity if it was um, supported by um, sort of council in general and the other people that live on Brown Street to consider a one-way flow. It's a really, really low traffic road. It wouldn't have a lot of implications for anyone other than the people that live on it. Um, and if that was, um, that would be a way of actually providing additional cross-section that could be helpful in then addressing the offset of his fence to the curb. Um, we added in um, a um, additional tightening um, princess red banks that could be looked at, and that could be looked at independently of any other improvements that might be made at that intersection, just to slow the speed of people as they're turning from red banks into princess street. Mm, um, they, they, they speed around there. That's right, the yeah. angle is um, very, um, not very acute, so people mm. don't really have to slow down too much to make that turn. Um, we added in a couple of other intersection reviews with Chamberlain. Um, Chamberlain Main North, it had been raised as um, a desire to have that closed completely. Um, I don't, it, not necessarily warranted from an accessibility perspective or a safety perspective, but um, possibly something that could be looked at maybe even as part of the Main North Road upgrades. Um, so we just captured that um, opportunity. And Chamberlain Dawkins um, with the dip, um, we had, um, uh, uh, not really acknowledge that as being a particular safety issue in the original plan, but um, that would be an area that um, could it does be slow people down. It does. It Otherwise, does. they speed through there. And I think yeah. that would be the thing that if you take that out, mm. there is going to be a need for quite a. Um, it's a shortcut. Yeah. Off the main North Road, Wilson. Don't know what you think, Paul, but it's a it's a major shortcut. I'd leave that dip there. I was going to say, if we do take it out, we would probably need to look at some other civil interventions that would act the same thing. <laughs> because they all know the dips there. Watch them, yeah. and and they just they just hit their cars, scrape, and then they kick. they don't slow up at no, all. It doesn't stop see. them. Yeah, massive sign that says dip. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. So, 
Yeah, it's an interesting one. The people that big... actually live there don't want the dip to go because they know that there'll be even worse speeding. So I guess that needs to be considered quite carefully. That's right. It mm. would need to be part of a, a broader kind of management strategy across for um, Dawkins Road. Um, we've just added in a review of the cycling route. There was a comment that came up in the Hope and House. I think one of yours, Madam Mayor, um, that a walking and cycling plan proposed a change from the current bike direct cycling route to change the, the um, uh, uh, route from Ailing's um, Ailing Bride to take up at Panta Holmes. Um, and we had sort of adopted that recommendation into our um, into our discussion to facilitate um, the works that were being done for that in the walking and cycling plan. I think there is an opportunity, I mean, there's pros and cons to both of those options. Um, and I don't think that there's necessarily a reason to not provide supportive infrastructure for cyclists on both of those routes. There's probably a bit of a question from a wayfinding perspective as to how you would communicate to people what the two routes um, mean. So there might just be a bit of work that would need to be done in terms of determining which one actually gets incorporated into the sign so that people don't get confused about how the how the route then connects back to the rest of the infrastructure um, but certainly the um, the ailing street route um, is pre preferable um, in terms of its speed and volume um, um, characteristics on the actual road network but maybe not quite as um, well connected in terms of then linking back to the um, cycling route that was going to be incorporated onto the other side of Redbanks Road. Um, and then we also just identified some other um, uh, options that had been talked about um, within um, and raised quite often just to acknowledge that we had heard that there were concerns around these and they weren't being ignored, uh, but that they were incorporated into other parts of the um, other processes that council could consider. So parking concerns, for example, um, there's um, there a number of enforcement criteria around existing parking. Uh, there are a number of opportunities when rolling out the other um, uh, implementations to actually um, look at what the parking impacts might be and to resolve some of the parking issues that have been raised. So it wasn't that we were ignoring what had been raised, but actually it was captured in um, sort of holistically in some of these other interventions that we were recommending that they would happen concurrently with those. Um, and speed limits, um, a, a question about 40k area limits and also potentially looking at the speed limits on Red Banks Road um, in front of the school. Um, 40k area limit is a really interesting one, very timely. I had an invite in my calendar yesterday to a forum um, for traffic professionals around what the impacts of 40k speed limits are and have been. And I think that would be very helpful in council in determining whether they wanted to pursue that with um, the department um, across across the local area. Generally speaking, 40Ks were very popular when the default speed limit was 60 because of the large differential and there has been less support for it now that the um, default speed limit has come down to 50. So it'll be really interesting to see what the findings are of this uh, forum presentation on um, 40K speed limits in the current, in the current environment. Um, so this is effectively then the updated priorities map, um, which just captures those additional elements, a few different colours and, uh, and um, locations where um, the um, recommendations have been um, sort of supplemented by the second round of community consultation. Um, and obviously then can be worked into um, council's overall priorities for rolling out uh, the um, improvements that we've been discussing. One more. There was a, um, a lot of commentary around the speed management, so I thought this would actually be a really um, sort of informative um, case study for Council of what we were suggesting in terms of the potential for staging some of the speed management implementations, given that we're looking for relatively small reductions in overall speed for people on the streets to get them closer to uh, 50 kilometres an hour 
um, or lower. Um, this is a, an example that I um, happened to drive, park, drive through um, on my Christmas holiday to Perth. They let me in <laughs> and they let me back out again, which is very nice of them. Um, but uh, it's an implementation that had just recently been finished in um, Netherlands, which is a residential suburb in, um, in Perth. And the cross section of this road, Elizabeth Street, is about 10 metres wide, which is similar to the road width um, in a lot of the streets in Williston. And it, um, I think, really demonstrates a number of different interventions that could be put in place depending upon the ultimate amenity and speed environment that we're seeking to achieve on the streets. So our initial recommendation was because of the number of streets that we're trying to deal with is we could go through and do um, the uh, protuberances at the intersections to help reduce the pedestrian crossing distances for people that are walking um, uh, from um, crossing the road at the intersections. There's also then, that then creates effectively indented parking areas um, for, um, uh, to separate the parking, parking from um, the, the traffic that's traveling through. Mm. But what's also they have done here is they've actually line marked with quite heavy line marking, a relatively narrow trafficable carriageway, which will um, assist in um, bringing the cross section of the street narrower, which brings down um, the speed. It's a um, sort of a, like a psychological reminder of the fact that you're not driving along a high speed rural highway. Um, the red the red treatment is really supplementary to that, but um, it um, and relatively expensive um, sort of add on if you like. Uh, but um, so not necessarily something that would, you would need to do, particularly um, initially if you're um, uh, keeping the existing pavement and not making changes to the actual um, uh, uh, wearing course. They have also then put in uh, little protuberances, which don't necessarily need to look like that, but they're um, again an opportunity to be able to do some plantings with some relatively um, sort of dense or high um, um, like trees that could um, grow up, which are just again amenity improvement, but also assist in the perception of people as they're driving along that they're in a residential area. Um, the and then they've also then treated each of the intersections with raised humps. So that's the the piano key line marking on each of those approaches is actually then up onto a platform, and that's your um, active speed control. So you could leave that or speed humps you know, some of the more um, costly civil interventions um, for a, um, a subsequent stage, if you roll out um, some of these amenity improvements that um, will assist in reducing the speed and we only need it to be by a relatively small amount. Um, and that would then be an opportunity to then review how um, much of an improvement that's made to both the amenity and um, the physical environment for the streets. Um, and then an option to then come along at a later date if needed and actually do some more intensive civil works as well. Councillor Kosh. Yeah, thanks. Just, look, just looking at the map and the piano key markings, you said it's raised. Is that a designated pedestrian crossing that people need to give way to pedestrians or not? No, it's not. And it's a really good question. And something that we, um, um, it's probably a bit of a, a failing if you Hang on, stuffed up. Hang on, Paul, if you can turn off. It's okay. No, I think I'm right. Yeah, sorry about that. Sorry. Um, a, a little bit of a failing. I was going to make a criticism of um, how they have implemented um, that. Um, it's really important that that people don't perceive anything other than zebra line marking as being a priority for pedestrians, because if drivers aren't going to perceive it as being something they need to stop for to give way to pedestrians, but people just bravely walk out onto the road. That's the worst case scenario from a pedestrian safety perspective. So we do want to make sure, and this is where the plantings and the um, protuberances that are mid-block can help. Even when you put in road humps with the markings that they have on it, you actually want to make it quite clear to people that they are not a pedestrian crossing facility. And by having landscaped islands in the vicinity of that and no connection to the footpath assists in 
making sure that pedestrians are aware of their environment and the fact that that's actually not a, um, a wombat crossing or a zebra, a zebra crossing. Um, there's another treatment that they have in Perth actually along the footpaths where they've adopted this uh, kind of a yellow, almost like a um, railway crossing, like a yellow um, sort of checker pattern. And again, it has absolutely no meaning under the road rules and I would um, be worried about people coming along to that and being confused about what the meaning is. So we do need to be really careful about um, as innovative as we can be, but without going too far down the track that we're actually going to step outside of what people understand our interventions mean from a safety perspective. Mm -hmm. To be sort of consistent. Yeah, sure, Paul. Just on that, we, my wife and I, we train guide dogs, the volunteers we train guide dogs. And I, sometimes I wonder, you know, whether the dog would actually see that as a pedestrian crossing. That's my concern. Yeah. Okay. Can't speak, can't speak for the dogs, obviously, but, um, but that's why if you if it's um, if the you limit the pedestrian facility through there, then hopefully the dogs will never get to that part of the road and have to make that decision about what what its interpretation is of, of what to do. Um, so, and that basically sums up my um, sort of summary of where we've got to in terms of the interventions. I think the next slide is for. Um, just to... All good. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of over to you now. Um, if you have any questions for us, um, what do you think of the updated treatments? Do you have any other questions about the community engagement? Deputy Mayor. Thanks, Beth Heron. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for that. That was very interesting. There's one uh, particular uh, question, and that, that is this: uh, out of this whole uh, process of looking into uh, that, uh, the Williston area now has become a very busy industrial area. Um, and uh, was there anything that uh, was pointed out to you about the amount of trucks that use Paxton Street? Well, I'll pick on Paxton Street, for instance, you know, where they come off the road. We can't do nothing about Redbacks Road because that's the main truck route that brings people through Gawler and that. But the Paxton Street area now, with the huge chicken factory that's down the end there, like there's something like about six trucks a day, uh, huge semis that carry thousands of chickens that go in and out all the time. They approached me oh, years ago about the fact that... Um, a lead in one way from the bypass would illuminate all the trucks that actually use all that area. Did any of the people in the area, uh, like I'm talking around Brown Street and Holmes and all that, mention about the uh, advent of trucks? Because there's the, it's in the last 12 months, uh, it's estimated about another 30 trucks uh, in some cases a day use those, those roads. <laughs> Um, the, there was a number of comments about trucks, but they were um, generally about trying to keep trucks off the residential area, um, off the residential streets, and the concern about trucks um, using the residential streets as a bypass for Paxton Street, particularly the Paxton Street um, Main North Road intersection. Um, the difficulty, the difficulty that we've got with Williston, and again, it comes back to kind of the historic planning of the area, is having the industrial area sort of landlocked in the bottom corner means that um, Paxton Street is really the only street that you um, have got an opportunity to provide access into that, which doesn't have a significant number of houses on it. So it's always a balance when you've got competing uses like that to say, we could reduce the number of trucks on Paxton Street but where would they go mm. and where would we want to redirect them to? Now, um, I take your point about the opportunities to improve accessibility into Williston from the bypass. It's probably outside of what an LATM um, can consider because it's an, it would be an arterial road connection. And um, the, I haven't looked at it specifically, but the spacings of arterial interchanges and how they're incorporated into the road network is um, 
very kind of exact science of, um, from a safety and accessibility perspective. Um, and I don't, I, I'm sort of just trying to picture as well in terms of how you would actually get and where you would bring um, a, a new access from, from the bypass down onto at the ground level. Um, so uh, 30 trucks on Paxton Street. Paxton Street is effectively your main industrial collector road coming in and out. That, that, that's not um, a number that um, raises a particular concern to me in terms of the nature and functionality of that road. It's a nice wide industrial road, good sight lines. Um, the accessibility to the bottom part of it with um, how the um, access has been constrained at Paxton Street means that you don't have um, drivers having to turn right now onto Main North Road. Mm. They're directed up around to the yeah. roundabout. Um, so it's um, sort of fundamentally, there's not much we can do other than potentially like a, a grand scheme such as, such as you've suggested to actually resolve that. But um, the, the key thing was we sort of were looking at was um, there were a number of people that raised um, uh, desires to open up accessibility of other streets to the north of Paxton Street with connections to the road network such as Holmes Street. And I think from a management perspective, that's going to be then create potentially some difficulties operationally in stopping um, a large number of those industrial um, traffic movements, whether they be the staff that work there or the trucks, from actually choosing to cut through some of the residential areas, which isn't what we want to see. Uh, the group that uh, I know of that uh, are using the big trucks, they're, they're not trucks, they're semi-trailers, you know. And uh, uh, the thing is, it, it seemed to die at one stage, I remember uh, Tony Piccolo was working on it, but uh, the area uh, I realise is probably outside of what you ladies were looking at there. But uh, where it is, is where the Williston fo uh, football overall is. Uh, the area of land on the opposite side of that, that that goes up to the bypass is owned by the government. The government owned all that land. There was a proposal to put it in when the bypass was built, but it never took place. The land is still there. And the proposal was to allow the trucks to come in there, into the industrial area, and then out there by running along Patterson Terrace, which runs along the bypass and rejoins the bypass the other way. They came up against another hurdle because part of that land is owned by the neighbouring council, uh, the like council, and councils don't normally talk together uh, and that sort of stuff. So it, it, um, I think the, what's going on with now another five big businesses setting up there in that industrial area and trucks are coming in regularly. And you said about point the trucks go out and up Paxton Street and then out, but um, the, uh, guy at the service station says uh, every day that somebody just misses a truck because it makes that very congestive, you know, where the actual roundabout is and so forth. But um, I know it's probably out, outside of what you're putting up for us and I applaud it, but they also mentioned about the effect of slowing the traffic down. Well, that's that's great, but that's, that's the police department, as Sam keeps telling us, we're not allowed to put the speed limit down. The coppers have got to do that and the government have got to do that. So I don't know who uh, uh, means business. But there's no way, because of the truck movements, you can put rumble strips, you know, and things like that. You couldn't put them on Redbacks Road either. Um, you also mentioned about the school. Um, you were talking about a Xavier school, naturally. Well, see, that's like council. Yeah, so but, how, how does that infringe on...? Well, you've clearly not seen the hundreds of children that walk over that bridge every day, morning and night. Oh, yeah, it's a nightmare. And yeah. they hit that roundabout yeah. and they're, they're just on mass. Yeah, on oh, mass. I, that I agree with that. Yeah. That intersection mm. is an absolute yeah. problem, absolute yeah. problem. Yeah. It, the, the sight line is an issue. It's a not an insurmountable but mm. it is tricky oh, yeah. because I'm, you're right. I'm, I'm um, no, uh, I'd say 50% of people put in just cut the cut the fence down. It's quite interesting comments, and quite yep. useful. But yeah, there's a lot of kids. A lot of parents park along Redbacks Road. They park on Dawkins yep. Avenue. They park in that little car park near the near the bridge. They park at the intersection 
of, um, oh, I don't even, in light council, the T junction as you come onto um, Malala Road. Um, yeah, it, and they're all open, they're just everywhere. They, they don't care where they park. Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it, most of the kids are really well behaved, they know, but it, it, it's still uh, an issue that uh, we, mm -hmm. it, effectively it is our problem as council because they hit our, most of those kids are Gawler kids. You know. well, final, final question, uh, uh, with all the type of work you ladies do, what do you think of the advent of uh, Wombat Crossing? Where, what is um, I think that they are very effective when they're used in the right spots. I think that they are, um, it's always been in South Australia since I'm so I moved here actually. Um, Wombat crossings are a particular South Australian invention. I think we came up with the name of them. <laughs> um, and um, the additional um, visibility that they give to drivers of the zebra crossing line marking and the fact that there is a pedestrian facility there um, is, a, um, is great. I think that they are... Um, uh, It's a, it's a concern of mine when people might misrepresent speed humps for wombat crossings. I think we need to be quite careful about how we um, put those in place. But certainly, um, yeah, they, 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 their purpose isn't to slow traffic down, but that traffic has to slow down for the crossing. They have to slow down for the hump. And all of, it just adds to um, sort of a better environment for people who are on foot. So I might go to Councillor Kosh and then Councillor Fraser, We're waiting patiently. Uh, I just want to know, has, did anybody comment about the, uh, the connection between Two Worlds Road and Paternoster Road over the railway line, opening that up? Um, yes, there was a, um, a, a couple of comments about that. I think there was also a comment which is a, um, a pertinent consideration given what's been happening um, in our later summer months about um, emergency accessibility out of the area um, during bushfires. Um, the, the connection to there, and Zach and I actually had quite a detailed conversation about this last week, um, it's a, complica a complicated um, discussion because as you say, Paternoster is a light regional council road. Uh, the residents are, as I understand it, Gawler residents. So, um, if there was a connection put through there, it would fundamentally change the nature and operation of Paternoster Road because it would be a very convenient alternative access point to get into Williston. As it stands, Paternoster Road is not an appropriate road construction to cope with effectively being upgraded to a connector road to provide that level of connectivity from the rest of the, um, the, rest of the Williston area. And I think it probably needs to be um, treated very carefully in terms of making sure that um, that it's not used as a rat run to mm. avoid coming down the arterial road network. And um, having that as a closure there, I think there's certainly opportunities to improve um, connectivity from a pedestrian perspective. I understand that there had been some discussion um, in terms of also improving connection for pedestrians and cyclists under the bypass through there, but that's the department's land and there's been, um, been some pushback um, with that. Um, primarily around, I think, um, the safety of people walking through underpasses. So, the, all of these questions, you know, sometimes there's no simple answer. There's a lot of there's a lot of grey, and it's about just making sure that the decisions that council makes about what it does uh, carefully looks at um, how a change in one particular space is then going to actually have holistic changes to the overall operation of um, a number of different elements, which you don't want to create a worse situation trying to improve trying to improve. It. It's, re one. it's really hard to get onto the Stuart O'Grady bikeway. Um, mm. That's a real issue. There's a complete disconnect. Mm. Um, and that Paternoster Road is the most efficient way. It's still a bit treacherous when you go up onto Tilton Road and try and get onto the, onto the start of the, the bikeway. Um, but from Williston and from Gawler, that is the most effective. Going over that railway line and going along Paternoster Road is the safest way of getting there. Yeah, yeah, from Williston anyway. You... Yeah, it works. Yes. Yeah, not necessarily creating a rat run. Um, now, 
process of raising. As far as Xavier goes, I know it's in the Light Council, but the, the, um, the children that are causing the problem are Gawler children, so we have to address that. But we should really be working with the school because it's also their problem. So rather than the Light Council, it should be the school that we're working with on that issue. But um, apart from that, I really like the narrow roads. I think they're a really good idea for slowing the traffic down. I think that's great. And, uh, you know, you're never going to please everybody. Like reading the comments, especially on Jane Street, some people want the footpath on one side of the road, some people want it on the other side of the road. <clears throat> so there's no way you're ever going to be able to please everybody. But I think what you've done is great. Any other comments? Sam. I might just get Jane to talk, if oh, sorry, Jane, I'm putting a spot about wombat crossings and when their applicability, because there are some constraints with respect to wombat crossings and with respect to, I think, vehicle numbers per se. So you can't use a wombat crossing on any road specifically. Um, so, and I understand it's low, low vehicle numbers. Uh, so that's all right, Jane. I think that's relevant, just so there's some context for the members. Um, yes, yeah, so there are a number of guidelines that you look at in terms of uh, the, um, the volume of um, uh, tra the, the volume of traffic that is um, that is um, has to slow down. It has like a, a, a um, obviously congestion um, issues if you're trying to slow traffic down and um, and create. Um, Sort of large queues for people that are stopped. Um, there are a number of criteria around the speed of the traffic and the approach and actually needing to slow speed down so that people actually have the opportunity to see the facility and stop. Um, there are also, um, um, surprisingly, safety concerns around putting in pedestrian facilities which are relatively infrequently used because people that travel on those roads often become habitualised to not stopping. And it can get to the point that actually they forget to look for pedestrians because there's never any there. And that, that um, concern can also sometimes carry through even to pedestrian signals that aren't actuated often enough that for people to have red lights because they go through the green so often, they almost become blind to the fact that there's um, a traffic signal there. So there are a number of technical criteria around making sure that the facility is the most appropriate facility for the roads based on the pedestrian and the vehicle demands. Um, they also create problems, so um, for um, commercial loads, for example, driving up over humps um, can um, make it difficult for um, load shifting in the backs of the of trucks. Um, and generally, bus, bus drivers and public transport um, uh, guys don't really like them either because they have, um, uh, it's a difficult thing for the drivers to get over and it, you know, box around everybody in the bus. So um, you need to be really, um, obviously mindful again it just comes back to the same point that I made earlier that sometimes you look at something and think oh this would be a great um, option and solution but actually you need to look holistically at, at the environment that you're putting these things in and just make sure that you're not um, creating a different problem for somebody else by trying to fix the problem and there's often a number of different ways of skinning the cat you know there might be a different alternative that is just as um, just as um, helpful in fixing the problem you're trying to help but that doesn't have a whole lot of flow on effects that um, you might not have considered. Don? It's um, um, a dip road, but Main North Road, do we have any idea if that's on the radar to be done up? Sam? Yep, <laughs> thank you, Councillor Fraser. And I, I knew this question was gonna be raised tonight. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just pull out my pre-prepared, no, um, the, um, it is a priority. It's probably the next major arterial road priority for the township. Um, now that the southern end has been addressed through the um, Cullick Road intersection and, and Potts Road there. Um, I know the mayor has been advocating um, at some at every forum can in this regard. Um, and it is uh, something that the administration is working towards um, advocating and seeking to look at partnering with Department of Infrastructure and Transport. Um, so that'll be effectively ahead of the uh, election, the state election in uh, 2022. So that'll be our fo focus of our my team this year to start 
working on that with respect to with the department and how we might get that into the conscious consciousness of not just the, the politicians but the key decision makers in the um, business and we've started those conversations um but it's just a matter of progressing them and, and on that particular note i think this week or next week with my staff i've got a round table internal workshop in terms of how we can start looking towards getting more shovel ready with respect to that particular project. So there's been some work done, uh, but, there's, but there's some work that we need to do ourselves then to inform the conversation with the department. So maybe we can have the conversation with them at the same time for the beautification coming in to Gawler on the side of their, side of their road. <laughs> Yeah, so that that'd be that would certainly be part of it, and I think that's where we need to go internally when we have regard for this particular project. We need to think about that beautification aspect that we've been working on as a group, and and and, and then be consulting with the community shortly on as well. Brian, thank you, Mayor Karen and Sam. Uh, Jane, can I come back to you on the on the Wombat Crossing? Sorry to sound like a broken record, but. You know, like uh, we've got two legal ones in Gawler and we all always get told they're not legal, but they are legal. You know, one's in High Street and one's in Finnis Street and they really work well, you know. No one's been run over yet anyway. And, you know, like Bill O'Brien, who's a mayor of uh, the Light Council uh, and his committee and his council put one in the main street of Kapunda. We were up there on the weekend and uh, you know, what wives do, look at dress shops and things like that. Well, I don't like looking at them. And I stood there and I was there for half an hour and watched B doubles pull up and stop for people to walk across the road. It works perfectly. I then rang Bill yesterday morning and said to him, by the way, has all your, any problems with that whatsoever? Because we get told all the time it's a dip tie road, you can't put a wombat crossing on it. But, the Kapunda Council thought that it, it had to be there because it was a busy area of the street, you know. Um, I, I can't get my head around that because we've got a lot of elderly people in Gawler and we've got a street that's out of control with speed uh, next to our elderly centre where, uh, you know, lovely old darlings uh, collect there three times a week and they've got to try and get across the road before someone runs over them. Um, yeah, I hear what you say about the point of the way Wombat crossing, uh, 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 crossings work, but instead of putting um, speed humps and things like that for the safety of our people in the town, um, I just think, is there another way around the point of convincing, uh, well, I don't believe we should convince the state government because we own the streets, the council, but how do we get around some of the complications that we get told regularly, no, you can't do that? I mean, Jane Street's a classic example where the, there could be a wombat crossing because there's always talk about speeding down that road sort of thing, you know. Is, is, is a wombat crossing the answer? You walk down the middle of Jane Street, you don't see a, see a car. Which side of the I'm going to take you down Jane Street at various times. You clearly haven't been there for a while, Brian. You have not. <laughs> many, many, many years ago, and it's still quiet. <laughs> we walk down the middle of that road because there's no footpaths in the middle. <laughs> um, but they are focused to one spot for you pedestrians as well, and they focus to one spot from a speed management perspective. So broadly speaking, if say we were going to put one on James on James Street, it's a question of where we put it. If you put a wombat crossing in, people are, are lawfully obligated to cross at it rather than crossing within 30 minutes. I'm gonna be in trouble then. And then, um, and then um, you not then necessarily providing a facility that is a relatively expensive one for, um, to address the safety of pedestrians on James Street means that you've then sacrificed a number of different interventions that we could do in other streets as well. So I, I agree with you. I think that they are um, an excellent facility in the right place. Um, and the, um, in my view, the focus of council would be that if there was a particular spot where you had a number of people crossing and um, it was a, um, an area where the Wombat Crossing 
um, facilitated that and improved the safety for the people there, absolutely go for it, but you're going to have to also budget for that. So, so thank, thank you. Sam, you've got any other comments? I was just going to say that the, this plan doesn't propose any wombat crossings per se, and there are, but I, I will go to a point, um, Councillor Samble, that the state government through um, DIT has softened its approach to wombat crossings and there is some guidelines that explain how they can be facilitated in like government roads where previously that wasn't that was pretty difficult proposition per se so they can be facilitated on local government roads there's a set of criteria that would have to be met and my understanding is there's a threshold for vehicle numbers that actually is part of the assessment in terms of it has to be quite a at the lower end of vehicle numbers not a not a, a busy arterial road per se um, so it, it can be done um, but there are places of which they're suitable and that's really when these high pedestrian desire lines and high pedestrian demands in those areas that they'd be applicable to. But none in this particular LATM and maybe in the next one. Um, so I think we've got to the end of the, if there isn't, isn't any other questions. And I, I suppose it's- I can't see any other people putting their hands up, Sam. Uh, it's probably then, um, yeah. So in terms of the next steps, is that something that we pick up? Sorry, I'm just, in terms of the plan. No, that's right, I'm happy to finish off. So um, from here, obviously, you know, we've heard some feedback tonight um, in terms of the plan. It seems like it's, sounds like it's reasonably positive um, and the feedback from the community has been really positive and, and, and significant. And um, so it's been fantastic. The, we'll look to finalise this and present it to the April IES with a view of getting it um, supported to go to council and be ratified at the April council meeting. And that effectively then it'll inform our decision making with respect to budgets. And we do have some work that we're gonna be doing this year, this financial year, that are priorities that have come out of this draft um, in regards to some of the connection points. And I know that the team's been, and we'll present, we'll provide a bit of an update in the council report that we present to April to, uh, to the IS report to April, which will show what some of the, some of the ways we're already starting to implement the actions and what we're proposing for next year as well. Okay. Thank you, Sam. And thank you, Zoe and Jane, for coming along this evening. And thank you to elected members and Ben and Zach, of course, and Henry. Anybody else? No? I think I've covered everybody. Okay, oh, Sam. Yes. Um, so thank you, everyone. I think we'll wrap this up. Thank you to anyone who was um, listening tonight. Uh, um, I hope you have a very good evening. Thanks, everyone.